Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast, which delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought up by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. You are joining us for episode 317, Getting In Your Greens. This feels like a constant recommendation by both Allie and myself and really a foundation in our food is medicine keto program. We have to keep always coming back to that two to three cups of greens a day. And I can't tell you how often people fall off of it and they're like, why aren't my bowels good? I'm not getting the satiety all of a sudden. Yeah. Like it's the, it's the greens, man. Absolutely. Um, So today we're going to break it down for you from the food is medicine properties of greens to the nutrient and caloric density and volume metrics plus some information about sulfoquinivos. Um, you'll learn about that too. And, and most importantly, how to actually get that two to three cups of greens in a practical way on a daily basis. Yes. It's something that even Becky and myself fall off of at times. And it's like doing a 10-day detox or some form of a focused food as medicine reset. That's often the number one thing that I realize helps me to feel amazing in my body. I mean, I can feel it in my skin, like you mentioned, Becky, in my digestion, in my energy levels, just feeling lighter overall. And it's funny, when I was putting together notes for today's episode, it was a total throwback because we had a cooking class back at my Houston clinic back in 2014, almost 10 years ago, that's crazy to say. Uh, And it was a class called Eating Your Greens. Yes, I remember that. Yes, we had like three smoothie stations where we did green smoothies three ways. One was like an apple pie. It was a fun throwback to read. We could have put that one in our uh, smoothie ebook that we released earlier this year. Uh, The kale cannellini salad kale chips three different ways then we did a pesto crusted halibut and finished things off with a matcha chia pudding parfait Um, and I think one version of the eating your greens had like a blueberry crumble where we sauteed um, in that blueberry filling and pureed spinach oh yeah I remember that Mm -hmm. too Mm yeah that might have been in the kids cooking class but anyway so we have some throwback copy in here as well um, to keep you all inspired and a lot of food is medicine and like Becky said application to make it happen so so before we get into all things green, let's have a word from today's sponsor, Peak State Coffee. Yes, we absolutely love these guys as a new-ish sponsor to us and a product that we found at KetoCon earlier this year. Um, they are offering coffees with medicinal doses of adaptogenic mushrooms. So everything from lion's mane to reishi to chaga they actually include 500 milligrams of these mushrooms per serving and the way that they do it is really unique so most of the mushroom coffees out there are in these like single serve packets they yes. taste and feel like instant coffee and the coffee itself Mixed with is mud. not that good yeah <laughs> yeah Yep, that's a a way to put it nicely. Um, But the coffee itself is is not always that good or well-sourced. So Peak State is coffee with health benefits. It's actually whole beans that they infuse with the adaptogenic mushrooms to boost your brain, support gut health, balance stress, all while keeping a delicious taste that you love. And I know it's Brady Miller approved, which is a really hard yeah. certification to get he's, on your coffee. He's the coffee head. And he actually brought me over to their booth because he tried their cold brew and he like subscribed right away. And he's like, oh, Al, you got to try these cold brews. And my first question is, are there non-caloric sweeteners? Mm-hmm. Are there additives? Are there gums? Are there fillers? Um, and they just have really beautiful, high integrity product. Um, what's also important to note is that all of their bean sourcing are fair trade and shade grown beans. Um, They're also creating a a low acid profile. So if you're someone that deals with interstitial cystitis or bladder irritation or is avoiding coffee for the acidic nature for bone health, 
the Peak State Coffee would be a really great option to give you that low acid, non-GMO, also chemical-free and confirmed mold-free bean, which is really important when we're looking for whole body health. And then again, post the roasting process, they infuse the beans with basically like a tincture concentration of these nootropics or adaptogenic mushrooms to support immune health, cognitive clarity, and also offset the jitters that some people get from consuming coffee. So I know myself, I'm both sensitive to the acidity and the jitters, and I do really well with Peak State. Go on over to peakstatecoffee.com. That's P-E-A-K-S-T-A-T-E-C-O-F-F-E-E.com slash Allie Miller RD. That's a unique URL that'll take them there through as a listener of the Naturally Nourished podcast. And when you use the code Allie Miller RD at checkout, you're going to get 20% off of your order. Again, that's peakstatecoffee.com slash Allie Miller RD. All right, let's get into just some brief updates before we do today's content all about green. So first off, coming up on Thursday, November 17th, we are having an immune webinar, all things immune. Becky could use that right now. <laughs> if you can't hear it in my voice, I'm on the tail end of this pregnancy and got a sinus infection that's kicking my butt and I've yes. done all of the things. Yes. But you can come and attend on no, um, November 17th. It is going to be $9.99. Um, so really an affordable price point for an hour plus live with myself. And I'll also be doing a detailed Q&A. Um, you'll be able to, once you sign up for this, you'll have a form where you can submit your immune based questions and I will cover as many of those as possible in the development of this class. Also to note, we still have a flash sale going on on our immune collection of formulas. So that includes our herbal immune, which is our thyme, oregano, lemon balm, and sage blend. Um, that's really important for upper respiratory or um, infections in ear, nose, throat. Um, we're looking at our cellular antiox in this um collection as well, which has that NAC and glutathione, really superstars of the whole world pandemic that we've been talking about as far as reducing oxidative stress and cytokine storms and even supporting the bronchial function and respiratory tract. Um, and NAC in the cellular antiox aids as an expectorant, so it can even help to uh, break up mucus phlegm or a persistent cough. Vitamin D balance blend, both in the liquid and capsule form will be in there, our Bio C Plus. Um, we will have our top 10 immune boosting formulas. And on that vein, if you missed it, we have now come out with two amazing syrups. Um, and so if you get our weekly eblast newsletter, um, you'll definitely have already heard about these two formulas. Um, but I'm just going to kind of tease it now. And at the end of today's episode, we will share about them. Um, one is a ginger organic honey based syrup that's like an expectorant for cold cough and then there's an elderberry plus which has medicinal mushrooms and a lot of immune based herbs like astralagus so can't wait to share about these formulas we'll do that at the end of the episode let's talk about greens yes we've gone through like half a bottle each of, of yeah. those syrups already during the past couple of everyone days. needs them in the yeah. household yes yeah. all right um so ali why do we need to eat leafy greens Let's so, start there. Yes, there are so many reasons, but I would start with antioxidants and this concept of eating the rainbow or the color spectrum of produce providing different unique phyto compounds or plant-based antioxidants. And when we think of like leaves on a tree, for instance, leafy greens actually have the capacity to go through the full color spectrum. So you can actually get the robust yellow, orange, and reds like you would see in the fall in the Midwest, not in Texas, <laughs> but in the fall in the Midwest and other areas where the leaves fall off of the trees. Um, we're going to see that potentiality of that chlorophyll pigmentation going through that entire rainbow spectrum. So we know that we are getting a robust and diverse antioxidant influence <clears throat> when we're eating leafy greens. And this plays a huge role to combat disease, to even boost metabolism, to offset oxidative stress, which drives inflammation, and so much more. Yes. And so these phytocompounds, beyond their ability to even reduce that oxidative stress, protect against free radicals, um, you know, beyond the function of an antioxidant, leafy greens even have other 
health benefits. Yeah. So of the flavonoids that we've seen in even kale, let's say for instance, selecting one leafy green out there, there are over 45 different identified flavonoids. And two of the main compounds are campferol and quercetin. Uh, I used to present about this all the time um, when I was a nutrition student and then as a dietetic intern, when I was uh, talking about the importance of local or sustainably grown produce and the difference of nutrient density of organic versus conventional because most of the agricultural literature out there was comparing just minerals or just nutrients and not in the world of nutrients of phytocompounds and antioxidants and flavonoids and that was really kind of cutting edge research in the early 2000s understanding this whole array of getting back from you know the two hybrids of your granny smith and your red delicious apples and now coming back to things like the you know pink delicious and the cameos and you name it and we're learning that different presence of flavonoids are in each different unique heirloom or varietal and they're also going to be in a higher density or a higher volume in a plant that has to be more resilient so for a plant that has to grow um, without being constantly amended in the soil um, and has to seek nutrients in the soil or root deeper or a plant that actually is fighting off pests versus being coated with pesticides and insecticides those plants actually through that robust challenge if you will will actually create and manufacture higher amounts of these flavonoids which is pretty remarkable and cool to see and we do know that all of these have specific disease fighting properties so campferol is known to be very powerful as an anti-inflammatory it has a big role in cancer care it can modulate apoptosis or basically that cellular suicide effect that's regulated by our immune system it plays a big role in angiogenesis or providing vessels to um, cells and we often look for like anti-angiogenesis support in tumor uh, metastasis in the body it plays a favorable role in metastasis and then regulating inflammation and so big player in the world of cancer and inflammation and then quercetin got a lot of uh, I think attention in COVID essentially yes. um, as a compound that can both bind the spike protein and and also that has the ability of supporting as an antihistamine um, and a powerful antioxidant. So quercetin can reduce swelling, it can aid in blood sugar control, and even has mechanisms in respiratory illness as well as heart health. And within respiratory illness, we even think extending to seasonal allergies. So the big picture is beyond this color of the rainbow, all of these unique flavonoids that leafy greens provide us give us these strategic food as medicine boosts to prevent cancer or aid in cancer treatment outcomes, to promote detoxification, to regulate cholesterol levels, elevating HDL and reducing those LDL oxidized compounds, preventing depression even and having a role on mood with folate and other powerful players in the microbiome. And we've seen leafy greens to aid in metabolism and energy levels. Yep. And that's just two of the, yeah. the constituents. Um, kale alone, we've seen identified 45 plus different flavonoids. So pretty remarkable yeah. stuff. Um, and leafy greens are also going to be a big recommendation when doing a gut cleanse, not only you know for the soluble fiber aspect, which is going to help to broom out and really reset the colon make sure you're going to the bathroom every day. Um, but the prebiotics in greens are going to aid in supporting bacterial balance in the gut. Absolutely. So you're getting a nice amount of insoluble fiber, a little bit of soluble fiber in leafy greens. And there's particular prebiotic compound in greens called sulfoquinivose. And sulfoquinivose actually has antifungal prebiotic properties. So it strategically actually inhibits the growth of yeast and candida in the gut uh, and combats dysbiosis while supporting bifidobacterium growth. So we even talked in our long haul episode about how those that have been infected with COVID have suppressed or lower levels of bifidobacteria that it's really important to really re-inoculate. And that's what we're saying you know, using that targeted strength probiotic, at least one bottle post-infection, and then maybe going down to that restore baseline. But equally, I would argue important to be getting those two to three cups of leafy greens daily because that's going to serve as that natural fertilizer, if you will, or support that robust growth and the maintenance of the bifido strain, which is, you know, that one of the top most researched compounds of favorable gut flora. 
So, so cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then let's talk vitamins and minerals, which this might be the only area in kind of the mainstream where greens (laughs) actually education. (laughs) Yeah. Get their credit. We talk about like vitamin K and B vitamins, but let's go into that. Yes. So I think if anyone listening is a dietitian, you know very well in your drug nutrient interaction course that it was harped to you that leafy greens have vitamin K and that this would interact with warfarin and coumadin, which are blood thinners. And that is because vitamin K plays a role with blood clot formation. In fact, when we think in infancy, that's why often there's that advocacy for vitamin K injection or vitamin K drops because the concern of bleed out following the quote unquote trauma of birth. So we need vitamin K to actually aid as a coagulating factor. It also plays an important role in bone health. It aids in um, regulating that calcium in the body. Leafy greens provide us also a source of calcium and magnesium. Magnesium maybe is a bigger star of the show to think of here. Um, So we think of when stressed, a further need for leafy greens because magnesium is depleted with stress. And we use magnesium for over 300 different enzyme pathways in the body. So super powerful player there for magnesium, calcium, further for bone density, and also calcium can aid as an anxiolytic or reducing anxiety. Um, So another good player for stress. We get manganese, and then we also even get some trace minerals like copper and uh, zinc in leafy greens. And then we think to our B vitamins as a big area of focus as well. So in our B vitamin family, namely folate. Uh, I was always taught that you think of foliage as a source for folate. So we know that liver is going to be the most potent form or animal forms often will be more dense in B vitamins. But in the world of vegetables, leafy greens will be a really great option of folate. And in our B complex, we even include spinach as a compound within our nature made folate, that quadrifolate, that methylated form of folate. And we incorporate a little bit of organic spinach in there to just get that true full spectrum there. Yes, and that is always a high recommendation when I'm working with a client who is newly pregnant. I'm like, okay, you've got to find your way to get your two to three cups of of leafy greens. And I think worth saying on the um, vitamin K drug interaction, it doesn't mean you can like never have leafy greens if you're on one of those medications. Basically, you don't want to significantly alter the amount that you are consuming. So to go from like zero to two to three cups might be considered significant. You'd want to kind of slowly stair step your way up. Um, But if you're someone who's already eating salads and doing green smoothies, you wouldn't need to stop doing that if you were on a blood thinning medication. Um, And then you might layer on like EPA, DHA and or Inflamazyme to give yourself some more support there. Yes. And I would say, you know, if you're someone or you have a family member that was doing more of a standard American diet and they are on one of those medications and they're looking to add in a daily green smoothie and a salad or something like that, you can always get their PTINR um, Mm -hmm. run and that will look at their clotting factor and then that can adjust medication dosage accordingly. Yep. Okay. And if all of that wasn't convincing enough on the nutrient front, I think the volumetrics argument is really important here too. So this is why the salad as like a diet food really took off. You know, it's a big salad that takes a long time to work through and chew through. It slows you down and that volumetrics is this concept that is going to fill you up um, for a low, you know, calorie density. Um, but all too often, we off- also will see industrialized oils, carbs, preservatives kind of creeping into our salads and messing with them as being a better choice. Most definitely. And so, you know, I would say for sure that when we're talking about a food selection that is nutrient dense at the least caloric impact, um, that leafy greens would be a really fabulous choice because one cup of greens is only about 25 calories, some 11. So just depending on how dense you're packing in those greens and how fibrous those greens are essentially. Um, And so for 11 to 25 calories per cup, you are, like you said, Becky, getting like 10, 12 bites and that takes time. You have to masticate or chew. That chewing process is going to create some thermogenesis and we will have stretch receptors in our stomach that send signals to our brain telling us that we're full from that volume experience of the vegetable consumption. So at lower amount of calories, we still have good perceived satiety. Um, And, you know, you're going to, when you get to that world of two to three cups of greens, 
again, see a lot more meal satisfaction and a lot more chew time, probably slowing down. Um, and this can all contribute favorably for a weight loss experience. But when we are getting in our greens, that is one that I always sometimes say it could be a tricky order when you're at a restaurant because we tend to perceive a salad to be good, but restaurants want all of their food to taste good and be addictive. And so they are going to add often a industrialized oil-based dressing. So it could have soybean oil or canola oil in it. Um, there can often be croutons. Um, there can often be additives that would make salads nutritionally inferior maybe than just having a grass-fed burger patty and sliced avocado. Mm -hmm. um, so we do like to weigh that out. And I often will say, you know, salads are good at home unless you really know you're driving fats. And you can always just request pure olive oil and lemon. Um, and or avocado, um, I love to do that and like mash that with fresh lemon or an acid of choice. Yeah, if you don't know for sure or if your server doesn't know if they have real olive oil, which a yes. lot of times it's a blend. It's like right. soy and corn and a little bit of olives. So right. we can call it an olive oil. Made with olive you know. oil. <laughs> um, but the avocado, you know, you physically see it and you can't really alter that structure. Yes. Totally. Okay. Um, so before we get into different ways to incorporate greens into your daily life, let's just talk about what to do um, and look into, you know, if you don't tolerate greens well. Yeah. So I immediately think about how, well, we just talked about sulfoquinivose and how that aids in as a powerful tool during a gut cleanse or maybe preventing yeast overgrowth or dysbiosis in those that have susceptibility or prior history with candida. Um, but all too often, that is a main population that tends to not tolerate leafy greens. And so the dance there is really getting to that root cause of the dysbiosis and resolving it so that we can tolerate. So I often think of dysbiosis as one of the driving factors. So it could be SIBO, like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or yeast overgrowth, or just a gut pathogen or infection that would be driving intolerance to greens, where maybe we're getting really dynamically bloated, um, and or we're dealing with belchance or belching or flatulence. I made a hybrid word, belchance, <laughs> <laughs> belching or flatulence, um, or we're dealing with cramping or irritation. Um, and so I often will start with adding in berberine boost, even though this is not a carb food, for instance, we're not taking the berberine as a hypo glycemic, but we're taking it as an antimicrobial and antifungal and antiviral compound. Um, and then if they get some result there, or I might just have the individual do a probiotic challenge and hold the greens, but do the probiotic challenge. And in that sense, we can see maybe by just adding good gut flora from that sterility, they end up tolerating greens once they go up to that targeted strength probiotic or they fail the probiotic challenge and go right into the beat the bloat cleanse. Um, and so on the latter hand, if they did more improved outcomes with using the berberine, but yet still not getting outcomes, we might say, okay, let's still do that six week beat the bloat cleanse. Where we're bringing in the berberine boost, the herbal immune, the GI cleanup and the ultimate detox. And um, remember now you can do that beat the bloat cleanse as our bundle um, of those four supplements, which is the protocol, if you will, on a supplement level. Um, but there also is that archived program in which you can watch those three live classes. And that really helps you to troubleshoot other areas of dysbiosis. It talks about translocation of bacteria. So what happens if you're getting thrush, for instance, how to support your lymphatic system and so much more. So if you don't tolerate greens and you suspect dysbiosis, that would be the strong recommendation. Now, maybe even an earlier thought process is to just start with the digestive enzyme. So for individuals that haven't been eating a lot of raw, um, their gut, you kind of, if you don't use it, you lose it yes. type of thing. Yep. And so their gut maybe isn't making as many of the hemicellulases and the enzymes that break down those dense cellulose fibers. Um, so taking our digest aid, which is a digestive enzyme suite to break down carbs, proteins, and fats, all with ox bile in there and DPP-4, um, that digest aid about 10 to 15 minutes prior to uh, your leafy green preparation could also support more favorable digestive outcomes, offset the side effects, and also ensure that you're getting all that nutrient density absorbed into your cells where you want it. Yes. <laughs> um, so maybe digest aid and digging into dysbiosis might be appropriate 
appropriate for some. And then um, I would say if still not seeing outcomes, you may want to, and you're touch and go with other families of food. So maybe it's like, well, I did fine with a romaine head lettuce, but when I put chard in my smoothie, I felt like there was an atom bomb that went Mm -hmm. off in my gut. Or when I had kale chips, things were really off, but I can do collard greens. Um, Then you may want to look at the MRT test, which looks at that 180 foods and chemicals um, and really identifies what specifically is driving inflammation as a food ingredient in your body. Yes. And then this might seem overly simplistic, but making sure you're chewing your greens. um, I can't tell you how many of us are just whiffing down that salad at lunchtime. And it's like, if that's the option and you're seeing, you know, greens actually come out intact in the bowels. Yes, digested. Absolutely. But if we're looking like, you know, leafy green poops, basically, yeah. you may just not be taking the time to chew, in, to chew them. Down. And so A, slow down. B, look at preparation. So, yeah. you know, doing something to mechanically break down your greens, whether that is chopping them very, very thinly and um, massaging like you would a kale salad. So adding some salt and acid, uh, that acid and fat, you know, in a salad dressing too, will help with, um, absorption of yes. all of those nutrients that we talked so about. Right. Vitamin A, greens. vitamin yep. K, they require exactly. fat to yep. be absorbed. They're fat soluble yep. nutrients for uh, sure. But yeah, mechanically breaking down in that sense, cooking your greens versus consuming them raw. A lot of times they're better tolerated cooked. And so you would take that two to three cups of volume and cook it down to what it cooks down to, which might be, you know, half to one cup, yeah. depending on the, the green. You don't need to be consuming two to three cups cooked per se. That would be a lot. Yes. Um, and then um, also considering a smoothie, and we'll get into a few more <laughs> recipes, I'm sure, in a moment. But a smoothie as a really good way to mechanically break that down and pre-digest Yes. And I love the idea of massaging. That was also a big thing. I remember moving to Texas and being like, oh, people don't know about massaging kale here. (laughs) And, um, you know, when we are, yeah, yeah. when you are, you know, doing that massaging breakdown, you're breaking the cell walls of the plant. And that is releasing enzymes from the plant itself that also liberate some of the bitterness of the flavor profile and that activates the nutrients. So, um, yep, the preparation of chopping or massaging and then ensuring you have acid and fat and salt all plays a big role in enhancing the digestibility as well as the nutrient density. Yeah. And like massaging till your fingers are literally turning green. green. I used to teach that fingers, in, yeah. in cooking classes even before I met you. Yeah. Um, all right. So if you, even if you are, you know, better tolerating or digesting greens, just find two to three cups every single day might seem like a lot or seem, you know, arduous. Um, but We encourage a variety of different ways to get these in. So it's not green smoothie after green smoothie after green smoothie. It's not salad for every meal. Absolutely. And so, you know, I am a smoothie girl because that's how my lunch would look when I'm in clinic (laughs) because I'm always high stressed on a clinic day and I don't have the time to slow down and chew. And I often sip on my nourishment through sessions. Um, And so that to me works really well to get that pre-chew. Um, but we do have to note for an individual that has um, thyroid concerns, especially Hashimoto's, hypothyroid, um, or goitrogenic um, influence and like any presence of goiter or history of goiter. Um, when we do bake, or like roast, saute, or cook kale and some of these higher goitrogenic greens, this will deactivate those goitrogens. And so that would be more favorable for individuals that have existing thyroid conditions. I would say it'd be absolutely reasonable to get leafy greens in a smoothie like twice a week, Um, but you'd want to go for the majority of your times um, as cooked, especially in the world of kale. And then you could go for like leafy greens, like your butter lettuce gems and your arugula and such in the raw way. Um, but getting a variety, like Becky said, both raw and cooked is going to be the best way to reap all of the benefits and the nutrients in your leafy greens. So I think of forms of salads, of slaws, of soups, uh, kale chips, um, steamed or braised greens, and then smoothies or stir fried. Um, and so all these would be just different time preparation. Um, one thing that I really love to do as seasons shift, um, and I'm not craving green smoothies 
as much as we're in the fall now is I love to heat up a jar of bone broth and then just take two handfuls of like pre-chopped like I'll take a bunch of lacinato kale I will um, de-rib it so I'll take that main um, stem and I'll pull the the leaf off of the stem and um, I will take those greens roll them up and chiffonade them and put them like in an airtight container and then real easy I'll just grab two handfuls of these shift greens and put them in my bone broth as I'm heating it on the stove top and then I get like a yummy like soupy chew Um, that's very deeply satisfying for me it has a good boost of all the benefits of course of the bone broth still getting 20 grams of protein not getting in the naturally nourished grass-fed way but seasonally a really nice kind of braised cooked down option and so those are kind of the two things that I go back and forth from is the green smoothie and the greens in my bone broth and then I definitely love um, a big green salad as an entree and I just switch up the toppings based on season so like now I'm in like delicata squash and chev goat cheese and pomegranate seeds and roasted um, pecans whereas in the summer there might be watermelon and feta and cucumber cucumber in the salad or um you know there might be beets and and then chego um and roasted bone in chicken thighs um so as long as you are rotating your um kind of flavor combinations of your salads and your two to four toppings that's a really great way to kind of plug and play and not get burned out I always discourage that what I call like kitchen sink salad (laughs) where like people just put like whatever is in there you know like I got my bell pepper my cucumber my whatever and it's just rinse and repeat the standard like salad bar yeah salad yeah Yeah. and you know like I mean every now and then I love cucumber cherry tomato red onion hearts of palm I just did a green goddess dressing last night that was beautiful with a little bit of uh, Greek yogurt and like a cup of half of basil and parsley and um, I even put some cilantro in there and and lemon as my acid um, and a little bit of avocado to kind of help with that that creamy green uh, flavor profile oh and chives Um, and so I just like to kind of drive by what flavor profile and then I will pick either the dressing based on the toppings or I lead with the dressing and then select the toppings to fit the dressing is kind of my thought process and there are a million different combinations Um, we have lots and lots of salad recipes on the blog I was just going back through some of the like fall favorites in preparation for a different episode so tons of um, salad recipes over on the blog and then for smoothie recipes um, I would say to refer to our YouTube channel as a really good place so we have a whole smoothie and shake playlist um, that we are slowly adding more and more of our tried and true favorite recipes and just showing you, you know, in a quick like five to six minute video, um, what the benefits are of all the ingredients, why we combine them in the way that we do, and then taking you through, you know, a quick recipe. Um, And there's also our smoothie ebook, um, which features 20 plus smoothie and shake recipes, and it's only $1.99. So a really good starting point. If you just are burned out and like need some inspiration on smoothies, There are several green smoothies in there and several that you can just add greens onto, especially if you don't really care if the color turns a little muddy. Usually we just don't for a picture, (laughs) but we kind of do in our own kitchen anyway. Oh, totally. Most of my smoothies are brown. Yep. (laughs) And then, so aside from, I'll tell you guys about my favorite smoothie, and I don't know if there's any tweaks you're doing recently, Becky, but my go-to standard green smoothie that I like to do um, is going to have like a third cup of frozen mango. And we can link the YouTube video specific on this. I think it's called like Allie's favorite keto green smoothie. So I do a third cup of frozen mango because with my metabolic flexibility that works for me, I do about a third cup of full fat coconut milk with two thirds of water. So I'm basically making it like a light coconut milk, if you will. Um, I add in a tablespoon of flaxseed. I add in a generous inch of peeled ginger, a tablespoon of chia seed. Um, Blend that with two and a half to three cups of leafy greens. And then I add in that naturally nourished grass-fed whey at the end and just kind of whip that in to incorporate. And that is like, I would say of a given month, I'm drinking that at least eight to 10 times. (laughs) Yep. 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 That's That's one of my favorites as well. I've been doing a lot um, just because I'm really working to get Noah into smoothies as like that after school, you know, protein hit, especially if he comes home with a full lunchbox, which has been happening (laughs) recently. I think there's so much distraction for toddlers um, at lunchtime and his lunchtime's at 1030 
a.m. also. Um, and so I've been doing um, like a PB&J yeah. variation um, with blueberries, frozen cherries, either peanut butter or almond butter, a um, little bit of coconut milk diluted with water as the base, and then I'll rotate in whatever greens we have on hand. Spinach is probably the easiest one to kind of yep. sneak in there and still preserve some of that vibrant color from the the blueberries and it ends up being like a dark purpley yeah purpley brown <laughs> smoothie um, and then of course a, a scoop of that grass-fed whey yep awesome love it and then um so aside from all the inspiration we have in the ebook let's talk kale chips and like yeah. flavor profiles because this is you know now we should be able to get kale pretty much everywhere everyone's farmers markets should be abundant I think of kale as like the star of the fall and Thanksgiving season. Um, And so kale chips are a really great option. I will say um, once you make them, they are quite hydroscopic. So you cannot really store them in the refrigerator. I was just telling a friend yesterday, she was like, look what happened to my kale chips. And I said, well, did you put them in the fridge? You have to leave them out at room temperature with open air. Yeah. Um, And you might even put a paper towel or something that's that's drying around them. Um, But if you have ruined your kale chips in that capacity, I told her to just then, so- I said, throw them in scrambled eggs the next yeah. morning. So, yeah, yeah. or add some bone broth and braise them down. It's not like it's a gone product. Right. But I will say homemade kale chips, unless you're using a dehydrator um, and you're doing them in the oven, you will want to pretty much make them to eat them um, real time. And so thinking about maybe making smaller batches or, you know, making when there's enough household members to eat a whole pan or two. Um, and the way that I like to do kale chips is basically basically tearing like two inch, um, you know, one by one or one by two inch pieces of kale. Um, I'll use a combination of extra virgin olive oil and avocado oil, or I might even use melted coconut oil, depending on my flavor combination. And then um, I like to add uh, a different variety of flavors, depending on what the vibe is and what the rest of the dish is. So I might just do like um, some onion powder, some garlic powder and dill and sea salt and make that kind of like a sour cream and onion situation. Um, I might do a spicy one with red pepper flakes and smoked paprika or a pinch of cayenne. Um, I love doing some with shaved Parmesan. Um, So like parm and black pepper is a flavor profile that I like. And then often I'm just good with just salt or like I've even played with like the everything but the bagel seasoning, um, which has like the sesame seeds and um, also has that onion and um, garlic um, impact as well. We do a lot of truffle kale chips too. Yeah. Like, um, truffle little, salt or truffle, truffle salt. Yeah. 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 So basically you want to heat the oven like 300 degrees, like lower heat is better. And then about like 15 to 20 minutes, you do want to watch them. You want to let them get crispy enough to where they crunch with like a little pre- compression of your finger, like a little, um, break of a, um, full crunch in your mouth. You don't want them soggy. Um, and, um, they really are delicious though. It's an easy win. And as we're still in football season, I feel like maybe you could <laughs> replace someone in your household's bowl of chips for a bowl of kill chips right. and, and see how they do. Um, if you do good flavor combinations, it'd be a really great way to get your greens in. Totally. I'm thinking about my fall garden that will be rocking by the time yes. um, this episode airs. And we had Noah into kale chips last year, so I'm sure he'll be even more into it. I still year. have the great cutest video of Steli making them with me when yeah. she was like 14 yeah, yeah. months. Oh, it's so a great cute. activity for yeah. them to like tear. And, yes. Yep. So yep. fun in those leaning towers. Yep. And then just to note, when you're preparing kale raw, um, you may want to be in a call out, especially the lacinato kale. Um, we could also see this on our collard greens, but the winter greens are much more prone for aphids. Um, and the more turgid or dense greens, especially. So like when we think of the bumpiness of the lacinato mm-hmm. kale, aphids love to they set up camp. In yes. Yep. <laughs> in those little um, kind of, kind of um, uh, what are those called? What do I want to call them? It's almost like a honeycomb back looking yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I always rinse and check for aphids and just kind of use the back of my fingertip and my nail kind of just, just kind of comb them out. Um, or I'll use a little um, light kitchen sponge, like a natural material sponge. And um, I like to rinse those out, but it does give me that piece of um, confidence that the produce is organic and that if bugs are able to live on my greens, that means that they're not that toxic. And that actually gives me a little bit more peace of mind than never seeing a bug on my said produce. So 
you just kind of want to be mindful and pick them out. Um, and um, we already kind of talked through the massaging process with salads. Another thing to consider in a world of a stir fry would be like greens often will be added at the end. So we talk about this in the food is medicine for the whole family program from root to fruit. Um, and so when we think about cooking preparation and time, if we're doing a stir fry, we would start with the roots like the, um, this could be shallots and garlic or onions or carrots. Um, all these would be their roots. Then we'd go up to the stems and then the fruits of stems would be like asparagus. Or if you had chard, you would actually saute your rainbow chard stems here. Um, I would not saute kale stems or or no. collard green stems. I think you require three stomachs to break those down. Yes. So give those to, you know, use those in your compost um, in your house or whatnot. Um, but you could do the rainbow chard stems at that, that process. And then fruits would be like your bell peppers, your snap peas, anything that botanically has seeds inside. And then as you're sauteing each of these, you know, about maybe five minutes each as you're adding them in, final would be those leafy greens. And you'd throw those greens in, coat them in all of the fat and flavor, and then add like a half cup of cooking liquid to get everything kind of braised down and um, meld all those flavors together. So that's kind of the thought process of a stir fry. And then you would just play with whether it's an Asian profile or whether you're going um, kind of like a black pepper sauce um, or mustard glaze. That would all just be kind of depending on what you're cooking up with your protein in there. Yes. Um, Let's talk about maybe different ways other than salads, stir fries, soups, smoothies, um, different ways to add other forms of greens or um, greens that we don't typically purchase maybe. Yeah. So just kind of thinking of like application of, you know, when served this, where could you fit greens in instead, I guess, sure. is yeah, yeah. kind of a thought process. And so, you know, I always think of if um, even at an Italian restaurant, if I want bolognese and I see that they have uh, kale or collard greens or spinach on their menu, I will ask for the bolognese on a bed of greens instead of grains. So think of that always as a mantra. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing as a, instead of rice um, in the world of stir fry. So swapping out your greens as the base of the bowl. Um, and then um, if the restaurant isn't willing, just get it on the side. Um, and that works fine too. Um, I think of like romaine lettuce leaves or endives as like boats or scoops. Um, so if we're talking about like a dip, um, anything from like a French onion dip to like a beet hummus, et cetera, um, even guac, um, thinking of using greens as like a crudite, um, a way of having that raw roughage um, as a vehicle for the fat infused flavor, the dip itself. Um, looking at also for thinking of like a replacement for a taco shell or a burrito, this is where we could use a collard green, um, and actually roll with a rolling pin or a jar to smash that stem. Um, so you maybe don't have to remove that stem. Definitely the bottom woody part you could V out. Um, but that middle part you would just roll to kind of break with that jar, um, or rolling pin, the cellulose density of the stem that's going to flatten that. And then you use that as your base for a taco or a burrito or an easier lighter would be like a butter lettuce um, as little baby tacos Um, thinking of then just you know rotating in season and incorporating like braised mixes I love getting those at the farmer's market often they'll be cheap and they're often um, going to have really good stability in the fridge versus like spring mixes which you know maybe only last a week max Um, A lot of the braised mixes will be a combination of like mustard greens and different forms of kale. So it might be like a red Russian kale or a white Russian kale or a boar. So you're going to get a lot of different heirloom varietals in there, probably with some collards and some chard. Uh, maybe some Malabar spinach and different fun heirloom varietals. Um, And the braising greens essentially would be added in that stir fry um, type of approach or cooked down into um, broth, like I mentioned. And also to note, you can puree greens into soups and do a cream of greens. Totally. And I love doing that too. Um, And you can keep it dairy free if you're dealing with mucus and phlegm by using coconut milk. Um, and literally just adding like five cloves of raw garlic yep. into beautiful bone broth with like four to five cups of greens and pureeing that and then and adding some lemon. Yeah. yeah. Coconut yeah, milk yeah. and lemon. And yeah. it's like delightful. Delicious. Yeah. delicious. And I'm thinking about our um, braised collards with bacon as a Ooh, good way yeah. um, to really, you know, get family members who might not be so on board with, yes. with greens. Just add bacon to anything, bacon and bone broth and cook it down. Delicious, delicious. So I will link a ton of these recipes for 
more inspiration for getting your greens in. Um, hopefully that gives you guys at least, you know, five different new ideas from what you're already doing. So I'd highly encourage, um, kind of rotating those in. Let's talk about our new herbal syrups, unless you've got anything else on no, greens I th- I think that you want to hit. I think we done, did, did it. it. <laughs> we did all the greens things. So hopefully you're all inspired to eat more greens and you have a million ways to do it. Um, and as always, beyond Becky linking all these, when you make these recipes, when you're feeling inspired to get your greens, if you're on your social, always tag at Ellie Miller RD. I love seeing you guys applying the things that we're putting out in the Naturally Nourished podcast. And if you love what we're sharing on the podcast, make sure you go on over to Spotify or iTunes or wherever you are listening and um, share why you love the Naturally Nourished podcast along with a five-star review. All right. So let's talk about our two new products before we let everyone go. So first, the Herbal Ginger Syrup. Um, And this one was the first of the new products this year that we released. We were super excited for this formulation. Um, It is using the base of organic honey. And it combines dry and fresh organic ginger along with wild cherry bark. And wild cherry bark is a known cough remedy. Um, And then lovage. Lovage is an herb that provides a coating for inflammation in the throat um, and is mucilaginous, so somewhat of like a oopy goopy protectant. Um, And we're going to get good expectorant effect from the ginger. Um, This is supportive of suppressing cough as well as aiding with the aches or the um, pain associated with cough and and sore throat. Yes. Um, and this one, Noah even likes it. He's like, spicy, spicy syrup. Yeah. Spicy. Um, super, super cute. Um, but we've been going crazy with this one at home with everybody sick. And it can even be added in, I'm thinking like a hot toddy yes. preparation. I added it to sparkling water the other night just for like a different kind of fun way um, to get it in, but you know, great for kids of all ages. The honey in there is going to be heated and cooked. Yep. Um, so, so you don't more, have to wait. Yeah. You don't have to wait till one year. I'd mm-hmm. say six months plus once you're doing solid foods and Most kiddos definitely. coming home with a, a cough could be utilized. Yeah. So a little bit of nerdy content on the featured ingredients. So lovage, as I mentioned, um, is a compound that has it's a plant that has bioactive polyphenols and natural occurring plant compounds that can support antioxidant status and immune function and it helps to support the whole body's immune response whereas the wild cherry bark has the bioactive compounds including polyphenols carotenoids anthocyanins and terpenes that aid in the support of the antioxidant status in the body while aiding as a cough suppressant Um, And then the ginger itself also aids in a healthy inflammatory response, supports antioxidant status, and can support a healthy immune response. So we're getting that synergy of all three compounds for cough, throat, overall immune and anti-inflammatory support. But we really think of this for every kiddo with the gunk. Yes. Yep. <laughs> and we have dosage for both maintenance use as just, again, an anti-inflammatory antioxidant. And then we have dosage on the bo- on the website is where we put this um, for more aggressive or active use during an active time of infection. Yes. So if you go over to the individual pages, which I will link in the show notes, it'll take you through all of that um, dosage for kiddos through adults. Awesome. Um, And then we've got our elderberry plus um, syrup. So beyond just the elderberry that we've been recommending to you guys for years for, you know, everything from cold to flu to cough to COVID to all of the things. Um, But this formula actually brings in some wild cherry bark that we just talked about. Um, So similar application there in terms of a, a cough suppressant, um, high antioxidant, and then it's got a blend of several different immune supporting mushrooms, um, including shiitake, maitake, um, it's got beta glucans in it, um, and then it also has astralagus. So going way beyond the classic, like just elderberry, um, that you would get, you know, over the counter or at the grocery store. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's what makes it a plus. Um, And when you're getting those mushrooms in there, those are going to aid as immune modulators. So there was conversation back with elderberry and COVID early on about were we worried about this actually potentially interfering? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kicking up the cytokine storm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so noting that combination of adding in the shiitake, maitake, and the beta-glucan, those are going to support modulation of the immune system so we wouldn't go into that overdrive mode. Yep. And we haven't seen that with, you know, s- nope. individuals who are starting off healthy anyway. Right. So right. not really a concern. So you're getting that added benefit though of that anti-inflammatory immune um, boost along with immune modulation. And um, the astrologists we've been looking for um, incorporating for a while because in our micronutrient assessment Often we're seeing that as a cellular protective compound, so it has both antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties, of course, as well as immune system response. So go on over to AllieMillerRD.com. You can find both of these in our immune collection, which again, we have discounted through the end of the month of November. So go on and grab a bottle of each of those to keep in your medicine cabinet. Both of them have dosages for maintenance throughout cold flu viral season, as well as during active infection time. Um, and those are based on uh, weight of the individual and both of these can be used from babies all the way through elderly population with fabulous effects and both are really fantastically flavored and an enjoyable um, supplement to take Um, so go on over to allymillard.com and check that out and while you're there you might consider also grabbing a spot in my immune class which will be november 17th Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.